Last time I was here, just so you know, I was partnership development representative last time I was here, which basically means that I raised money for the school. And it's amazing how when I change job titles, how many more people actually like me and talk to me and call me. When I was partnership development, my phone never rang. Now that I'm director of alumni relations, my phone rings all the time. But it's actually good to be popular, and I'm happy to be here. And I'm also happy to bring you greetings from Dr. Silas McCormick and our LCU campus community. The Apostle Paul's prayer to the church at Philippi is our prayer to you this morning. Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel, from the first moment until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you today and we ask um, for your promise to be true, that your word will reap a harvest. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your guidance and leadership. And today, may we hear, may we follow, may we obey. We give you all the praises in your name. Amen. Uh, Tim and I were actually talking uh, a couple of months back about when I was going to come and, and what exactly he wanted me to do. And he said, well, I'm flexible. I said, well, let me send you some ideas. And he came up with the idea of self-control. <laughs> and so, if, so Tim told you earlier that he gave me an easier topic. I'm not really sure that self-control qualifies as an easier target. And that's when I first started working on this. My, the idea kept coming up to me about when it... Self-control when it feels unnatural. And I, and I got to thinking, when exactly does self-control feel natural? When exactly is self-control an easy thing to do? I might even go so far as to say it sometimes repulses us just a little bit. Um, and I, and I, obviously I want to focus on you know Galatians 5, and that's where we'll end up today. But as we do that, I kind of got to thinking... How does self-control unfold in the New Testament? What, is, what are the ideas behind it? In the first place that we find self-control is, is not in the fruit of the Spirit list in Galatians 5. Like I said, we'll get there. But actually, the first time we discover it is in the book of Acts. Um, Luke introduces us to a local governor by the name of Felix. And and what he does is for what Luke does is he kind of unfolds the curtain, kind of pulls back the curtain a little bit on Felix's life and who he is and how he thought. And in Acts, Acts 24, beginning verse 22, it says this. It says, Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. Now, what proceedings are we talking about here? Paul is actually under arrest. He is fighting for his life at this point. He is testifying to the governor about who Jesus is and what this new religion, they call it the way, Christianity, what is the way all about? So Paul is literally, basically defending his life at this particular point. And it's an easy verse to gloss over verse 22 where it says that Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. But I want to stop there for a second. I want you to think about this. Felix knows about this new movement among the followers of Jesus. And Luke doesn't just say he is familiar with it. Luke says he is well acquainted with it. And the rest of this verse that you're reading up here, I want you to hear how that unfolds. He's well acquainted with this. Listen to what it says next. It says several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who is Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about, and pay attention to this list, as Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. Now, things turn around pretty quickly here in this text. So what happened? I find it fascinating reading Luke's description of Paul's words. What does he emphasize? Did you catch it? Righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Now, we don't necessarily know what it was that made Felix freak out. 
Okay, we don't know. I used to think it was the talk of the judgment to come. I used to think that Paul gave him one of those good old Southern Baptist fire and brimstone sermons and Felix got uncomfortable. And that might be the case, but I'm not so sure anymore. And here's why. Because first of all, Felix was well acquainted with the way. He knew about this faith. And he didn't just know about it a little bit. He knew about it a lot. And if you know about it a lot, then my guess is he would have an idea about the judgment to come. This would not have been the first time he had heard this. This would not have been Felix's first rodeo. And on top of that, his wife, Drusilla, is Jewish. And the idea of righteousness, the idea of judgment to come, probably didn't ruffle his feathers very much. His wife probably knew all about it. They had probably talked about it. He had heard all of this before. So what do we learn about self-control here and in the Bible as a whole? If you're taking notes, here's my first point. Self-control feels really uncomfortable. Self-control feels really uncomfortable, but it beats the alternative. Self-control feels really uncomfortable, but it beats the alternative. Here's why I think Felix freaked out. I think Felix freaked out because Paul was talking about self-control. When I was in grade school, uh, we got report cards sent home every nine weeks. And uh, our, my report card when I was in grade school had two sections to it. Okay? A left side and a right side. On the left side were the side I paid attention to. I was a straight-A student when I was in school. I had no athletic talent whatsoever, so I had to do something constructive in school, so I paid attention in class. And I got A's in math and English and social studies. You get the drill. That was the left-hand side of the report card. The right-hand side, however, was a totally different section. Back in the day, we actually called it comportment. Now, what comportment meant was how you behave in class. Are you nice to people? Do you listen to instructions? Do you work and play well with others? And I would usually get pluses on that. You see, there were three grade levels on that side. They weren't given letter grades. They were given symbols. Plus means good job. Keep it up. Plus slash minus means, ooh, room for some improvement. Minus means parent-teacher conference is coming up really quick. And I would get pluses in all of the areas except one category. And I remember how this is phrased till my dying day. <laughs> Exercises self-control. Now, why would this sweet cherub of a face of a boy... <laughs> Get minuses for self-control, let me tell you. Because if I saw something, I said something. I was the kind of kid that just kept talking. Teachers made me their project. You ever been somebody's project? You ever been somebody's hobby? I was my teacher's hobby. My teacher's goal was to get me to shut up. Here I am preaching. I just love it. I love God's irony in all of this. I had a youth group kid one time tell me, it's it really interesting because there's a connection to this. Amy, Tim and Amy, Amy was in my youth group. I was her youth minister at Lincoln Christian Church when she was in high school. And Amy's older sister, Lisa, one time told me, she said, Tracy, you don't think any differently than the rest of us. You just say it out loud. <laughs> and I got to thinking about it, she's right. Keeping my thoughts where they belong is uncomfortable. Self-control is difficult. All you have to do is look at the word. Right? Self-control. Okay? What does that imply? That implies that your engine is revving. And it's hard to keep that baby in park. Right? You know, you, you know what you need to do. But things just continue to get in the way. That post on Facebook deserves a response. <laughs> because that level of stupidity cannot be ignored. 
That piece of pie in the refrigerator is speaking to me. It's calling me by name. Back when I was a kid, if you wanted to look at dirty pictures, you had to buy it in a paper sack and hope that nobody that you knew saw you when you were coming out of the store. Now, it's easier, isn't it, in the moment to, to just give in, isn't it? You read the comment on Facebook and you just, you just got to be righteously angry. I, you know what I think though, most of the time when people say they're righteously angry, I think they're just angry. You see that piece of pie in the refrigerator and you, you know, you know what you need to do, right? The doctor showed you the numbers, right? The doctor told you what your cholesterol was, what your blood pressure was, what your weight was. You know. And yet here you are. It's easier in the moment to just give in. Self-control means to deny yourself something that you think you want. So why do it? I want to take you to an interesting text. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And in the, the context of 1 Corinthians 7, uh, at least the beginning, is, is the relationship between married couples. Between husband and wife. But I want you to hear something in here about self-control. Look what he says in verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 7. It says, do not deprive each other. If you don't understand what that means, to, when you get home, ask somebody. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time that you may devote yourself to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you. Because of what? Because of your lack of self-control. Look, I get it. Self-control is hard. But we have to look at the consequences of not having it. If we look at the consequences, a lack of self-control opens a door for Satan to do his thing. You catch what the problem is here? The problem isn't just the lack of self-control. The problem is what that lack of self-control leads to. It opens a door for Satan to interfere in your life. When we don't take care of our bodies, we allow Satan an inroad into our kingdom effectiveness. We jeopardize our kingdom effectiveness. When we constantly shoot off our mouths because we're right and by golly we're free what to say what's on our hearts because God bless America. We risk driving that person away from Jesus. When we choose to fill our eyes with images that promise pleasure but only deliver pain, we harm that intimate relationship with the one we love most. The world has enough examples about what a lack of self-control looks like. And I want you to see this because we're going to do another scripture at the end and compare the two. But I want you to see what Paul tells Timothy in his last letter to him. In 2 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 1, he says this. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient. Is that up there? I have 1 Timothy. I'm getting it. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. After that. All right. Okay, well, I'll start again. I'll start again. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. 2 Timothy 3. But there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, and right in the middle of this list. What does it say? Is it up there? Without what? Without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. I believe in Scripture that when you see a list in Scripture, the order of items in the list have some significance. And if you read 2 Timothy 3, what you find right in the middle of the list is the word lack 
of self-control. I believe that self-control holds all of these other items together. It is the linchpin. It's the center of the bicycle wheel that all the spokes come out of all the way around. And without self-control, then all of this other stuff, all these markers of the terrible times in the last days, all this other stuff has free reign. When our character takes on the traits of the world, then Satan shows through in us. We do his job for him. So what do we do? How do we do self-control? They're not going to be able to scream, but if you want to write them down, i got five questions that you ought to ask yourself. If you're getting ready to make a decision about something and you're deciding whether or not this is the right decision, I would ask myself these five questions, and one question leads to another. Question number one is this. Does the Bible allow it? Question number one is, does the Bible allow it? If the Bible doesn't allow it, don't do it. If the Bible doesn't say anything to it, or the Bible scandal does allow it, then move on to question number two. Question number two, does my conscience allow it? Does my conscience allow it? Because if the answer is no, then don't do it. But if your conscience does allow it, the Bible allows it, your conscience allows it. Question number three, what is the effect on other Christians? What is the effect on other Christians? Guys, I am convinced, I am convinced that sin has three definitions. Sin has three definitions. Doing something that you're not supposed to do. Sin of commission. Not doing something that you are supposed to do. Sin of omission. And the third one is anything that causes your brother or sister to stumble. You see, you can do something that doesn't qualify in any of the first two things, and it can still be a sin because you're causing your brother or sister to stumble. You don't believe me. Read the last part of Romans. Because in Romans, that's exactly what Paul's talking about. So what is the effect on other Christians? Maybe this decision is perfectly legal, scripturally, for me to do. Maybe this decision is perfectly okay for my conscience. It does not bother me. But at the same time, I am hurting other Christians by my actions. Therefore, I will choose to say no to that because I want to make sure that I honor them. Question number four. What is the effect on non-Christians? What is the effect on non-Christians? Christians. Guys, the gospel is more important than my rights. Amen. We're so good about defending our rights. And there's some, it's not a sin to defend your rights. No. But if defending your rights is costing you the opportunity to share the love of Jesus Christ with somebody who doesn't know the love of Jesus Christ, I will give up every right that I have in order that they may be saved. Amen. Question number five. What is the effect on my spiritual life? What is the effect on my spiritual life? It may be something that's totally within realm. It's in the, within the realm of possibility, biblically. Conscience-wise, it doesn't have an effect on anybody else, and an effect on non-Christian, but yet it affects my walk with Christ. It affects my journey. It affects my witness. I'm, I'm not going to do it. I think the key is found in 1 Corinthians 10.31, right? 1 Corinthians 10.31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Self-control, man. Self-control feels really uncomfortable, but it beats the alternative. That's point number one. Here's point number two. Self-control means doing the hard things for a very long time. Self-control means doing the hard things for a very long time. Look at what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9. He said, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way... As to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games, what? What does it say? 
Everyone who competes in the games, what? Goes into strict training. Take a wild guess what that word is. Self-control. Everyone who goes into the games does self-control. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but to get a crown that will last forever. I remember the first time I ever heard of Eugene Peterson. I read a book when I was in school called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And the title of that book just stuck in me. A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And here's what he says. It's not up on the screen. But you can hear, here's, here, here's some of his words. Christian discipleship is a process of paying more and more attention to God's righteousness and less and less attention to our own. Finding the meaning of our lives not by probing our moods and motives and morals, but by believing in God's will and purposes. Making a map of the faithfulness of God. Not charting the rise and fall of our enthusiasms. It is out of such a reality that we acquire perseverance. I'm going to turn this off. I'm going to get you some very serious feedback. I, I can talk. Self-control is not something that you get. It is not even a goal. It is a journey. If you were to ask Eugene Peterson or, or Billy Graham or other giants of the faith, when did you get there? When did you arrive at your goal? I suspect that they would say, when we opened our eyes in the presence of Jesus. That's when we got there. You see, Satan plays the long game. Satan doesn't defeat us with the big stuff. Satan does not come in front of my face with some big sin and say, Tracy, you should do this. That's not how he gets me. It's the choices that we make day by day. He wears us down like river over a rock. And by the same token, that growth also happens through the long game. Strict training is, by its very definition, moment by moment. It is a thousand small decisions in any given day about what to say, what to see, what to eat, where to walk, how to think. And if you think for a moment you're going to get all of those decisions right, you are setting yourself up for a glorious defeat. The hard things are not the big things. The hard things are the moment-by-moment -moment choices within the big thing that transform us over time. My marriage is a big thing. But my marriage honors Jesus in my daily interactions with my wife. That's how my marriage grows and thrives or doesn't grow and doesn't thrive. It's in those hundreds of daily moments, those hundreds of small decisions that we make over the course of time. My physical health is a big thing. But my body honors God in my daily walk. Like when last night I had that ice cream in front of me and I was deciding whether or not I was going to have the ice cream right before I went to bed. And I said, I'm not going to have ice cream before I go to bed because that's probably not the best thing for me. And I put it back in the freezer and I cried a little. But it's a decision. <laughs> it's a choice that you make. One of hundreds of daily decisions that you make. Can you do all of this? The long obedience thing? No. You can't. I mean, what was it? What was it? The Apostle Paul says not up on the screen, but what was it? Said, um, he said, you know, uh, not that I've accomplished all this or been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not yet have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which my God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. That's what we do. Can you do all this? No. Self-control is a misnomer, isn't it? And you know why? Because if it's up to self, control ain't happening. If it's up to self, control isn't happening. For the follower of Jesus, self is not the key. Look at Galatians 5. You've heard it before. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Self-control is part of the whole Holy Spirit package. There's no fruits of the Spirit, guys. It's just fruit. Let me ask you a question. You feel free to participate. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Is Jesus your Savior and your Lord? Yes. Does the Holy Spirit live and breathe in you? Yes. Then congratulations, you have the fruit of the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit lives in you. All of it is yours. I love what Peter told the, told the exiles. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, he said, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. You hear what he said? His divine power has given us everything that we need to live a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. I, guys, we are so, we fall into this trap, don't we? We just say, okay. I would be such a better Christian if I had more, look at the fruit of the Spirit, and pick the one that you are least in, right? I would be such a better Christian if I just had more love. I'd be such a better Christian if I just had more peace. I'd be such a better Christian if I just had more patience. And then we hear the words of the Apostle Peter to the exiles, and he says, you have everything that you need to live a godly life. That doesn't mean you're there yet. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you got it all figured out. But it does mean that you have begun your journey because you have his Holy Spirit. And look what he says next in verses 4 and following. He says, through these, <clears throat> he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption of of the world caused by evil desires. Now remember that list that we read earlier? That list from 2 Timothy 3, all those things that came as a result of a lack of self-control. I want you to see another list now. This is Peter's list. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith, goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, what? There it is again. And to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. The love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, you have what you need. And just as a lack of self-control is like that cylinder in the center of a bicycle wheel that shoots its spokes out and affects everything else that you do. In that same way, having self-control also spokes out and creates all the wonderful things that you can use that God has already given to you to make a difference in your life and in the life of others. Do you remember that prayer from Philippians 1 that I prayed over you at the beginning? Hear it again. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first moment until now. Being confident of this. Here's the important part that we emphasize. That he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. My friend, God is not done with his work in you yet. He's not finished. He is going to continue to do his thing in your life. And oh, by the way, if you get a tendency, as some people do, to read into this text, that God will do whatever it is that you want in your life, eventually you'll get everything you want. Hate to say it, Sparky. No. <laughs> not what he's talking about. What's he talking about? He's talking about the good news of the gospel. It is your partnership of the gospel that Paul is thankful for. It is the partnership of the gospel that Paul prays for joy over. And it's your partnership of the gospel that my God will bring to completion. He will finish his gospel work in you. Because 
as he started. Self control is hard. But it beats the alternative of Satan shipwrecking your faith and witness. Self control is not in the big things, but in the thousands of daily decisions that make up your commitment to the bigger. Self control is not about you, but about God who has blessed you with everything you need to live God alone. Lord, we come to you today because we can. Because you have invited us into a throne room. You have brought our incense before you and you breathe it in according to revelation and you respond with power, thunder, life, fire. You want to hear from your children and we are so grateful for that because we realize every day just shows us time and time again that we can't do this on our own. Father, we live in a world that we see the results of a lack of self-control. We've seen the last days because we're enemies. And they're not pretty. But we also know the truth that we discover in your word, and that truth is that we have everything that we need to live God's life. That fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 is ours. Your Holy Spirit is ours. And because of that, we have the love, and joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and gentleness, and the faithfulness, and the self-control. We have what we need to live a godly life. And as Peter told the exiles, when we have that self-control, it affects every aspect of who it is we are and allows that growth to continue. We're not there yet. But we press on. And take hold of that which you, Christ Jesus, have taken hold of us. We're not there yet. But we press on. Knowing that the reality, the truth, is that you will finish what you start in us. Not because we have miraculous self-control, because we don't. But because you live and die and live again in us and through us. Thank you, Jesus.